right, can you hear me all? Okay. <clears throat> so, um, thank you very much for coming. I can see lots of colleagues, lots of friends, family, so it's, it's really great to see you all here. My students are here and uh, my friends. And uh, so, um, okay. Uh, the um, uh, lecture is going to be about solving hard problems with interdisciplinary ideas and I'd really like to take you on a journey of uh, how my research was informed and uh, I'd like to share some um, uh, life-changing events that uh, happened uh, during, during that period and uh, also I'd like to show how the ideas from seemingly unrelated disciplines helped me to find solutions and by connecting the dots between uh, these different disciplines and taking a view outside of the box. I will show how this led to a whole, to, a, to the whole, to a whole that was more than the sum of parts. And there will be some interactive demonstrations as I as I go along. So um, the life-changing event number one was the energy crisis in our 1970s. It was driven by economical and political events. Uh, 1973 oil crisis and uh, uh, 1979 energy crisis influenced by the revolution in Iran. And as a result of that, solar energy got uh, a prominent status. And that inspired me to uh, study solar energy in buildings. So uh, in the 80s, there was a solar energy lab at Birmingham University, and I embarked on my PhD research there. And uh, this work taught me a lot about uh, uh, building behavior and uh, performance and um, um, I saw how buildings are influenced by user behavior and, and behave completely different from one uh, to another even though they were quite the same design. I monitored over 90 buildings in this uh, estate of houses in, in Bourneville and um, this was the uh, demonstration house where we had uh, a monitoring laboratory in the garage and these were some instruments there in, in the garden that measured solar radiation. Uh, this was an uh, instrumentation system that measured something like uh, 250 uh, parameters from different buildings. And that all went into this uh, computer lab in the garage. And all of these computers put together had uh, less power than my mobile phone in my pocket. Um, and this was the underfloor heating system controls that I've developed and uh, so I, I spent a long time there and this is where I learned to do computer programming. Um, this, was, um, um, uh, this was a series of experiments uh, in which I found that uh, it takes time to charge buildings with heat, that computer simulation models were inaccurate until calibrated, um, that uh, thermal properties of materials are not the same as, uh, as uh, quoted in books and that different people can make the performance of the same building completely different. So this is different, uh, different people in, in similar buildings and you can see energy consumption is, uh, is going up and down. And uh, this diagram here shows us that this is total uh, uh, conductivity uh, uh, of the heat loss from a building and uh, from different six different buildings but they are the same buildings and, and they're all different because of how materials are different. The most uh, most uh, puzzling thing was that the slope of this curve was actually proportional to the effective aperture of the glazing on the south facing side. These buildings had 11 square meters of glazing but the effective aperture varied from uh, from four meters to, to uh, six point something meters. So they were all different. And um, if it was possible to predict building behavior, because uh, you can't do it from uh, modeling uh, and simulation, because there are, there are gaps between uh, the, uh, what the model says and what the actual behavior is, uh, if it was possible to predict building behavior, then we would be able to save a lot of energy. And prediction was one of these things that was not quite uh, readily available. When I got my PhD four years later, uh, some of my friends were as happy as I was. And they told me that there was a job going at what was then Birmingham Polytechnic and I applied and subsequently I became a research assistant working on, uh, on an intelligent buildings project. And uh, many of you know that uh, Birmingham Polytechnic became this university and the uh, transformation since I started has been enormous. While working on the Intelligent Buildings Project, I was always 
um, uh, a bit uh, uh, concerned about how buildings are designed because uh, uh, they're not, they were not designed in order to expand or contract and, and adjust to the uh, uh, user needs, so sp uh, spatial needs of users. And uh, uh, at the same time, um, uh, you can see that uh, this kind of uh, spiral expansion occurs on all sorts of scales in nature, from, from a shell to, to, to a galaxy. And uh, could this be applied to buildings? So uh, I worked with uh, a few students on setting up, uh, up a project and applying this principle of spiral growth to building design. And uh, the result was that a created expandable and contractible house that can grow and shrink according to the uh, space requirements. And uh, we didn't quite do the uh, um, spiral growth, we just did circular growth. And um, uh, the building uh, had 10 different uh, parts. It was a kit of 10 parts and uh, it could achieve 10 configurations and uh, the space floor area was between 80 and 250 square meters. I tried to uh, uh, convince uh, a number of uh, housing associations to take this on board, but this was considered to be uh, far too radical at the time, and uh, this is still awaiting for a developer. Um, uh, the building had uh, all sorts of uh, um, environmental design features such as natural ventilation, natural daylight, flexibility of space and building services and integration of re renewable energy and green roofs, uh, slopes of roofs were appropriate for green roofs. And this is all meant to be uh, off-site prefabricated. And then <clears throat> there are a variety of configurations that are possible in order to create a varied looking estate. You don't want to create a very uh, um, um, sort of uniform looking estate uh, with this design. Okay, so life changing <coughs> event number two was when I came across uh, a book by Stephen Hawking, A Brief History of Time. And he says in his book, <coughs> Why do we remember the past but not the future? And uh, this is a very good question because most of the, <coughs> most of the equations in physics are time reversible. So not only that we can find out where a planet will be in the future uh, at some point in time, but we can also find out where it was at some point in the past. And that made me think about data that I obtained while monitoring buildings during my PhD. And uh, I came up with this simple idea. If you uh, plot external and internal building temperature, this is kind of idealized uh, temperature, uh, just to show the point that I'm trying to make. When you plot these two temperatures, external and internal, so external is uh, blue, internal is red, they might look something like this over a period of time. But when you plot them against each other, then they give this kind of ellip elliptical shape. So if we now bring forward in time the uh, red curve by several hours, we get something like this, and then when we plot them against each other, we again uh, get elliptical shape, but some, somewhat different. In fact, this is the uh, model of the future. We've remembered the future in this way, and uh, by using this in a, in a kind of learning situation uh, where this relationship is constantly learned, then uh, we are able to predict what is going to happen in a building over a short period of time. Encouraged by the uh, University Enterprise Unit at that time, I entered Smart Award competition and managed to become one of the winners. And university bulletins were full of articles about this new innovation and suddenly everyone, everyone knew who I was. And uh, with a handshake from a minister and uh, a check in my pocket, I managed to spin off a company and start developing this idea into a self-learning building simulation model on a microchip. The microchip was subsequently developed and named an Intelligent Self-Learning Electronic Circuit, or ISLEC, and um, um, there, were, there were no devices that could run this microchip apart from the development of electronics around it, so something else had to be developed in, in order to enable it to run. 
And uh, some time later, uh, with uh, the help of another uh, round of European funding, I managed to start development of a new device that would run the microchip, and this device was named Predict Predictro, combining the words predictive and control. So a few years later, um, Predicto became a bit more than a bunch of wires connecting a piece of silicon and a predictive control prototype was developed and it would take a long time before an opportunity arose to try it in practice. Now there's life-changing event number three. While wandering through a popular science section in a Birmingham bookshop, I stumbled upon this book on complexity and after reading the first few pages, I developed something of a fever that was making me read this book intensely, um, digesting new concepts and rereading it again and again. And this answered many questions that were accumulating in my mind over time and confirmed what I had suspected before, that conventional science may not be as good as we thought. A particular example that caught my um, attention from this new world of complexity was a computer model of self-organizing flock of birds. That was developed by Craig Reynolds in 1987. And uh, this was based on three simple rules that were driving each artificial bird. And without any master controller and only through interaction, a flock of birds, a flock-like behavior of this uh, model emerged and it flew around the artificial space and uh, it would break around obstacles and it, it would come together uh, after, after the obstacles. And that inspired me to work with students who developed the model based on their own simple rules. And indeed, this self-organizing model uh, occurred as a result of interaction and it flew around obstacles just like Reynolds's model. And uh, I'm going to demonstrate this. So this is um, <coughs> a very simple model that uh, works in the real time and uh, there's no master controller so there's nothing really terribly um, exciting about it except that it's very simple, there's deep simplicity in this model and this is a completely different view of how uh, people started looking at, uh, at science. Okay, so uh, going back to the presentation then. I'd like to sort of demonstrate some, some points here why this is important. If we have, uh, if we have uh, this kind of system of uh, several components and if you want to determine the total number of uh, states of this system, then we need to take one uh, component, switch it on and off, and then second component, switch it on and off and so on, but in a, in a certain sequence. And I, I demonstrate that with these two pens kindly donated by, uh, by the uh, by Birmingham City University, there's corporate logo on them. So uh, if, I, if, I, if I do this uh, one, one at a time, I do this, and I need to do that, and I've done about half of the uh, possible um, states of the system. And I do this again, and then I do that, and then I've covered all the states of the system. Now, as you can see, this doesn't take a long time in a short, in a small system, but when I do it in series, it takes rather longer than doing that. Okay, now, if we have 32 components and each one is interacting in five different ways, so three, three interactions are based on Reynolds's rules, one interaction with uh, obstacles and one interaction with the boundary. So that's five interactions, 32 components. If it takes one second to set the uh, system state, each system state, then we get a very large number, uh, five to, to the power of 32 seconds is this many years. Okay. And uh, there's no way we could do that as a, as a top-down model. This is how, how conventional science does. It uh, creates models with equations. It has master controller, master solver. 
we can't do that because the age of the universe hasn't been long enough for this kind of model to, to be done. Uh, and that's why models like this haven't been done uh, on the basis of conventional science. This led to a few exciting things that uh, uh, happened after that with a group of academic and industrial partners and uh, research council help I set a project on modeling of engineering structures and um, uh, the flock of birds model became an inspiration for, for, for this research and uh, um, they told us uh, the colleagues from uh, civil engineering department of, of Birmingham University told us this, this cannot be done how did you do that and uh, we said, well, we just did it because we used uh, this bottom-up approach and uh, uh, it's something completely different from what, what was uh, being used before. So I'm just going to show that actually that model does work. I'll show you the model that actually got us a big grant, four-year grant to, to do um, a big project. So basically this snap-through behavior is highly nonlinear and it cannot be done uh, using conventional principles, using finite element method. Okay, not only that we could do this in two dimensions, doing, doing snap through in two dimensions was uh, impossible enough, but uh, we, could only, we could also do that in three dimensions. And this is the result of one of the, uh, well, of, of, that, of that project that then led to doing a, a fully interactive bridge which we can push and poke and, and see what happens. So that led to research into dynamics of structures. As a result of all this work, I soon developed a module on behavior of complex systems and was delivering it as part of an EPSRC taught course across three universities and actually went to my old university where they were interested in ours doing it there also for several years. And um, why this is important is some of you may remember when this Millennium Bridge was constructed and opened to the public for the first time and um, on the first day it developed, developed a wobble. People were crossing a, 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 across it and uh, it developed a wobble and it had to be closed for a long time for rectifying the results of what was effectively a top-down approach. And uh, con this was a, at a considerable cost and embarrassment for everyone involved. So the reason was that bottom-up approach wasn't tested and uh, uh, dynamic behavior that occurred in reality could not be predicted with conventional tools at the design stage. And I very much agree with um, this quotation by Stephen Wolfram that uh, traditional mathematics, which represents natural and man-made systems with equations, has in the past few hundred years only reproduced the simplest of behavior. And as a result of this, we have a performance gap between designed and built. I consolidated uh, um, the explanation of the principles of emergence-based approach to designing this recent article in the design journal. And I also then uh, realized that uh, the flock of birds model could increase our, our understanding of how cities work, expand, contract, cluster, and fragment. And with the help of another European research grant, I collaborated with a group of local authorities and uh, uh, other organizations across Europe on development of what we called city analysis simulation tool. The results of this work were very interesting and showed some self-organizing aspects of how cities work. Some of the most interesting results were the clustering of, sim of similar use types uh, of, of uh, parts of a city and also the road following um, without any explicit instructions and using just attractors and repellents. New development followed the road here and this is how it happens in, in reality and this is a clustering of uh, similar use types in a city. Life-changing life event number four was the climate change. We had known for some time 
that carbon emissions cause greenhouse effect and global warming. But in 2006, carbon emissions were given the highest importance in building regulations. And uh, they, they, they actually were, uh, they became uh, more important than energy consumption. That changed the way how we perceived the environmental design of buildings and new methods and tools had to be embraced in order to rise to this, to this new challenge. At around the same time, I was made aware of a major inconvenience, and that is that uh, the year two, uh, 2050 was declared and, and, and considered as a pivotal year when several inconvenient things would coincide. The world population will be uh, over 9 billion, and the fossil fuels will be a thing of the past. The climate change could result in significantly higher uh, temperatures, and uh, as a result of that, polar caps will melt. Uh, that would reduce uh, the amount of available land, and that would change natural habitats. And um, by that time, I've already been working on environmental design of buildings for many years and started writing a book on designing zero carbon buildings in 2010 when I came across a very unusual house. It was designed by architect John Christopher, who is with us today. And uh, it was originally built in, built 170 years ago, and it achieved code for sustainable homes, level six through retrofit, which means it became zero carbon through retrofit. And it won the uh, architecture award from the RIBA in 2010 and won numerous other awards and uh, was featured in the media extensively. And uh, having heard a talk, John's talk at the British Science Festival about the house and having attended, having attended the open day uh, at the house, I asked him, who is monitoring the performance of your house? And nobody was doing it. So that led to long-lasting collaboration with John and his family, who uh, very kindly put up with us and uh, allowed us to install various instruments in the house. And we've been using the house as evidence base for our experimental research. I embarked on setting up a project and raised funding from the Higher Education Innovation Fund to purchase and install the instrumentation system for remote monitoring. And uh, the system that we installed monitors uh, about 20 parameters. These are solar, solar sensors on the roof. This is the uh, external sensor for temperature. These are energy meters for solar system and for the wood burning stove. These are, um, this is a temperature sensor. And all of that goes into a data logger which we access remotely and uh, we can find, find out what's going on uh, with energy performance of the building. And we can then uh, tally that with our models and calibrate our models. We also used uh, um, qualitative methods such as, as thermal imaging to complement the quantitative analysis from, uh, from the instrumentation system. And what's interesting here is to see that uh, this, is, this is a zero carbon house, that one there, and that is the house next door. And normally in a building, windows are the most leaky in terms of heat. And the uh, heat loss from the zero carbon house window is uh, comparable to the heat loss from the wall of the next door house. And you can see how, how much heat is going from the next door house into, into the tunnel here between the two houses. So you can just tell that this is very well insulated and, and uh, completely, you know, in a, on a completely different, uh, in a completely different world. Um, and you can also tell that from, from the outside um, this is a zero carbon house and this is the house next door. This work then led to a new PhD research program and to various analyses, including building simulation, calibration of simulation models, investigation of building performance under climate change, thermal comfort analysis, and so on. We found through this work that uh, zero carbon house is uh, minus 0.6 of a ton carbon negative. It is thermally comfortable because uh, the uh, um, predicted, uh, pred predicted um, percentage of the satisfied is, is well within the range of comfort, of the comfort zone. 
And uh, what, is, what, what is most interesting is that the uh, return on investment over a 25-year period was calculated to be 193%. So that's something like 7.72% per year, which is quite, quite remarkable, better than you would get from any bank or any investment. Um, by the time the instrumentation system was fully up and running, my book came out and uh, John very kindly hosted the launch in his house and uh, the event was attended by our dean, uh, by our, our colleague who uh, has left since Ruth Reed, who was uh, the uh, RIBA president for, for a couple of years and uh, by Roger Gotsif, uh, MP, who's not in this image. And um, the question is then, you know, why are we doing this research? What, what is really important about it? Let, let's uh, just stand back and um, consider why the context. I think we all know what we've been doing in the past hour. So, some of us may, may have been struggling through traffic, some of us may have been uh, uh, arriving in this building, and so on. But during that hour, in fact, during the past 50 minutes, the planet has intercepted enough radiation from the sun to run the world for the entire year. And that is uh, something that we really need to take on board. So that, that, is, that is a remarkable number that uh, really needs to be taken into account when we think about climate change, when we think about uh, is there or is there not enough energy. There is enough energy, but we don't have technology to use it. I wanted to investigate this on, on the building scale, so I, I, took, um, I took this uh, terraced house, which happens to be John's old house before it was retrofitted into zero carbon house. I took it from, in the computer model from, uh, from Southampton via Birmingham to Kirkwall in Orkney, and uh, I made it really very inefficient. It had no thermal insulation, it had single glazing, it, has, it had tungsten lights, and on a scale from 0 to 10, in terms of air tightness, it was 12. So when, when it blows outside, you could tell it blows inside. And, uh, and uh, it had a very inefficient boiler. And in every location, the amount of solar energy that landed on the roof, on three sort of surfaces of that roof, was greater than the energy needed for the entire year in that house. So the surplus is 151%, well, 51% in, in uh, Southampton and about 7% in Orkney. But if you multiply this with uh, efficiency of solar systems that we use for conversion of solar energy into electricity, then we get much smaller numbers, in fact 15% of that, and that's not enough. This just tells us that we need to do a, a far better job with our technology uh, we might think that we have uh, advanced technology because we have computers, we have mobile phones, but this energy goes literally over our head and we cannot use it. So if we manage to, through research, capture a lot more of this energy, and there are signs that uh, you can already more than double efficiency of solar panels, uh, then uh, we would make uh, zero carbon buildings, uh, we would be able to design zero carbon buildings much more easily and there will be no energy bills to pay, a fuel po poverty will be a thing of the past and uh, people can actually make some decent uh, return on, on investment uh, in, in these kind of buildings. I also have been looking into photosynthetic materials for building construction and got involved in uh, monitoring energy performance of houses built from this material. This is lime-bonded hemp. And um, the houses uh, in, in DISS in Norfolk, D-I-S-S in Norfolk, that uh, have been involved. And also this is in Swindon. And uh, this is what the material looks like. It looks a little bit like, like Weetabix, okay? And um, what's interesting about it is that um, if you compare, this is an analysis, comparative analysis of a school of 2,000 square meters, one, uh, one version of that uh, school is built from conventional materials, 
and it has a photovoltaic array uh, that converts solar energy into electricity. It converts, it gives 40% of energy to that building from solar. So that's the conventional case. The uh, case made of lime bonded hemp doesn't have any solar panels, but it starts, in terms of carbon emissions, it starts at negative point here because of the uh, embodied carbon content in, uh, in that material. And it takes 14 years for the uh, conventional and lime bonded hemp buildings to catch up in terms of carbon emissions. So this is why it is important to consider this material seriously because uh, <coughs> we could save a lot of, a lot of uh, investment on uh, putting solar systems into buildings where we don't really need them. And um, a problem with this material is that nobody can do design simulations. Um, simulation models that do this material haven't been invented yet. And this is where I re revisited um, the work that I was doing uh, during my PhD. And I was looking into uh, signal, digital signal processing that is normally used in uh, different areas such as uh, um, making music and uh, analyzing images. And um, I wanted to find out whether I can do a better job with, with, uh, with modeling. Um, so uh, this is a test cell from which I got data. This was based uh, at the University of Bath with, uh, with uh, whom I had collaboration. And you can see here that uh, this is a measured temperature. It's very stable temperature in the test cell is measured. But this one is simulated, one of the simulation models. And then this very stable line here is relative humidity. But this is uh, as measured, but this is simulated relative humidity. So you can't really do a proper job with simulation model. You, you use simulations for design. And the question was then, can that be applied? Can this knowledge and relationship between these curves in the test building be being applied to uh, another building, such as this winery in, uh, in California? Um, there was somebody who was very interested in looking into uh, this material uh, to um, build the winery. And I was asked whether I would be able to help with um, modeling. And uh, I was able to do that uh, to an extent because I was able to use uh, the equations when I was in my PhD, but I was doing that in a spreadsheet program and it took many hours to do. And uh, these people were changing, changing things in the building, so I had to do it again and again. So every time they made a small change, I had to spend four hours redoing the calculations. So I decided to actually build my own program that was doing the uh, uh, calculations, and uh, that reduced the time to something like 10 seconds. So instead of uh, you know, running four-hour calculation, I could now do uh, 10 seconds uh, calculation. I could actually then do as many iterations as they wanted. And uh, so we started from something called Fourier series that were used, that I used for digital signal processing. I created a model that makes uh, a filter, and then I verified that model using the monitoring data from, uh, from this uh, estate of, of houses. And what's interesting here is that simulation model is this is this uh, blue curve, and it overestimates by far the performance of the building design's internal room temperatures without any heating or cooling. And this is the temperature after filtering using my method, and that is much closer to the uh, actual building performance. As a result of that, I got involved in several projects. This is the Hempcrete Museum store for the British Science Museum which uh, won uh, the uh, Museums and Heritage Award in 2013. And uh, the use of this method led to uh, the investment and running costs becoming one third of what was originally anticipated. And then I was asked to do some other models. This is uh, uh, Howe Park School um, in Milton Keynes. This is uh, Glaxo Smith Klein um, building uh, called Ellipta. And uh, these buildings are at various stages of construction at the moment. Okay, so it's now time to 
try uh, to connect the dots and see and see what happens. And um, now there are a few dots here. For example, there's uh, remembering the future. There's cities uh, modeling dot. Um, there is uh, solar energy there. There is uh, cellular patterns. There are flocks. There's architecture, emergence, engineering, zero emissions, bottom-up modeling, and things like that. How do we connect the dots? To start with, I felt that uh, the knowledge on environmental design combined with building simulation, building performance monitoring, and zero carbon design needed to be consolidated. And uh, um, I managed to secure a publishing contract with Routledge with a 12-month delivery period for the manuscript. And this was a very scary experience because uh, <coughs> 80,000 words had to be delivered uh, um, on the dot within 12 months, otherwise their um, marketing machinery would be put back and they're going to suffer losses and uh, this is not what uh, was an option from their point of view. And um, as I haven't done anything like this before, except doing my PhD thesis, but that was uh, that was a long time ago and uh, under not as much pressure, um, I, um, I figured out that um, 80,000 words, if I divide that by the number of days that I have, then that's between 200 and 250 words per day, depending on how much I work during, during a week or during a day. And that was less than one telephone conversation sort of each time. So I thought, yes, I can do that. And um, as a result of that, the book came out uh, on time, and um, it is now... Uh, done really well, sold all, all over the world. I haven't made any money, by the way, because that's all with, with the publisher. But uh, um, what, they, uh, what they say, that there's, a, there's an old Latin proverb which says, nulla dies sine, sine linea, uh, and this refers to an artist who makes at least one line on his painting per day and creates the work of art without too much effort. And this strategy really paid off. So the book is very fortunately used, is being used now as core text in many UK and overseas universities and by major international consultancies. Yet more ways to connect the dots. I was conscious that a new type of professional was needed to champion zero carbon projects in practice. And uh, uh, collaborating with my colleagues, I developed a new MA Zero Carbon Architecture and Retrofit Design course, which has now been running for, for the first year. And the foundation of this course is the book on zero carbon buildings, as well as other related research. And I have a very keen group of very intelligent, intelligent and dedicated students. And they produce some very interesting work. And uh, by the way, guys, that won't affect your grades in any way. Um, <laughs> OK, so this is an example of a zero carbon house in Bahrain in a very severe uh, hot climate but this uses passive principles as well as evaporative cooling and earth tubes and this is all modeled uh, using simulation uh, software. This is an example of uh, a zero carbon house in Bangkok using traditional Thai environmental design principles and uh, reinterpreted for the current climate. Um, this, the brief was the students had to design these buildings for countries where they came from. So we had a student from Bahrain, we had a student from Thailand, and, uh, and this worked really well. And then another brief was, oh yes, and this is uh, just an investigation of how this building uh, becomes zero carbon. So you can see all these red lines going into negative, That's, these are carbon emissions, and uh, um, that was all produced by means of simulation. And um, this was a retrofit project where uh, the brief was to convert an old building, <coughs> which was uh, an Edwardian house built in 1930, into a zero carbon house. And uh, this particular design improved its environmental performance, improved the house environmental performance considerably, made it zero carbon, and increased the quality of the external form and internal spaces, and uh, you can see 
sell these things there. And I can pretty much relate to what it looks like in this house because this used to be my old house. I used to live there. And uh, uh, it looks much better like this. So if I decide to go there again, I might actually uh, get my student to, do, to redesign it. OK, on a continuing journey to connect yet more dots, I started discussions with Birmingham City Council and industrial partners such as Carillion and uh, Line Technology and IZ Design on how to scale up the Green Deal, a government scheme for improving energy performance of buildings without upfront costs. And um, we were conscious that uh, the Green Deal wasn't working very well and um, we uh, applied for for a research grant and we managed to get it and uh, this project <coughs> now integrates computer science and material science and, uh, and uh, production engineering, predictive control and um, social science, game technology and alternative economics. We are going to make people uh, compete in terms of increasing uh, energy efficiency of their buildings in terms of saving energy using their mobile phones and competing with each other. And uh, we're going to look into how alternative economics can be deployed to finance these, uh, these projects. We're going to be converting 10 houses into zero carbon houses. These are all going to be Victorian houses. The project is um, going to be for three years and it's, uh, it's funded by Technology Strategy Board and we are meant to um, roll out this method countrywide, so we need to have something that actually works for the whole country. Now just to put in the picture in terms of <coughs> the uh, complexity of decision-making process, this is not an easy task because if we have three objectives such as thermal comfort and uh, carbon emissions and uh, cost, and then within these three objectives we have variables, we have parameters that we are going to change and um, if we change wall construction, if we use six different types of wall construction and then three different types of glazing and uh, two different types of floor constructions and then window to wall ratio varies between 20 to 100 percent in steps of 10 and air filtration varies in steps of 0.1 between 0.1 and 1 air changes per hour and so on. If you add up all these all these different possibilities. If we, in fact, if you multiply all these different possibilities, then you get something like 408,000 different designs for a building. And I was yesterday at a conference in London on, on building simulation where some people were coming up with uh, 9 million possibilities, 9 million designs for a building. So how do you actually find a solution so we are actually dealing with a very complicated problem and uh, this kind of image rings a bell. We are trying to find a needle in the haystack, but how, how are we going to find this? <coughs> if we had uh, <coughs> God's view of the solution space, then it would be easy. We would find the minimum or optimum very easily. Uh, we could see where that, where that optimum is. But we don't have God's view and uh, the solution space may look like this in all directions. So wherever you turn, it will look like this. And uh, a point-to-point -point search would be very time-consuming and unreliable. And uh, the solution might, might lock into uh, a local minimum rather than global minimum and therefore it would be suboptimal. Sub -optimal. Instead of that, we use um, genetic algorithms that search solution space and uh, get back to with, with results of this what is called Pareto front. This is the front that is the closest to the uh, origin of the coordinate system and uh, these red dots are the optimum dots and then all of these white dots are suboptimum dots. And uh, this front gives us just the optimum solution but it gives us uh, um, a trade-off between different solutions. So, for example, if we want to minimize discomfort, then we have to increase carbon emissions or the other way around. And each point here, when we click on it, will give us what that solution consists of and uh, how 
uh, that can be converted into a zone. It'll give us a shopping list. So, going back to what's happening in practice in the Green Deal, non-experts use non-expert tools to deliver expert advice. And uh, in Retrofit Plus project, we want to empower non-experts to use expert tools. And uh, we are developing software front-end for mobile devices, and we are installing, or we have installed, a multi uh, core simulation server for parallel processing so that these things can be done offline. So this will enable energy advisors to, in the field to enter the building definition on their tablet and send the job to the simulation server and uh, then multi-objective optimization will be carried out in the background. They won't even know what's going on with that process, in that process, and the result will come back as a list of recommendations. In, the terms of, in, in terms of operator front. Connecting more dots, I wanted to consolidate the uh, worldwide activity in zero carbon buildings by organizing an international conference on this subject and uh, the conference will be held in, uh, in this building, in this lecture theater on 11th and 12th of September. And it has already attracted scientists and uh, engineers and researchers from 10 different countries. It is the first of its kind and uh, we're looking forward to uh, getting all the presentations uh, done uh, uh, or seen, uh, to seeing all the, all the presentations and to then publishing uh, the presentations in an edited book of proceedings. An international publisher, major international publisher is interested in this project and uh, an edited book of proceedings will follow. However, whatever we do, we still cannot compete with nature's designs. Termi termite nests are still the ultimate zero carbon designs. Internal temperatures in the nest are maintained within one degree in hot climates. And um, that's done throughout the year using natural ventilation and evaporative cooling. If, um, if the nest gets warmer, termites open more ventilation ducts and if that is not sufficient, they go deeper into the ground and uh, get a little bit wet and bring water back into the main chamber where the water evaporates. And uh, that provides additional temperature regulation. And um, they build a nest using local rules and interaction between them. There's no top-down design. There's no master controller. But can we regenerate these rules and use them to apply them to, to building design? I experimented with uh, some rules uh, of how to generate the form of, of the termite nest and I read some papers and uh, used um, uh, the rules from these papers and uh, it was indeed possible to generate different forms on the basis of uh, the uh, <clears throat> building and pausing time. Building time is the time when a termite deposit a block of uh, mud and saliva on a on a spot, and pausing time is when they overcrowd and uh, can't do anything. So for building and pausing time relationship, you get, uh, for different relationships, you get different forms of the nest. And uh, this obviously won't work, but this is plausible, and so is this. Can we use this to generate rules that make um, buildings work in a similar way? So can the rules from understanding how nests are built be applied to buildings? I'm going to make a slight digression now, which will start making sense very soon. Some time ago, I attended a lecture by Richard Weston, who showed us uh, his patterns resulting from radial crystallization of minerals in rocks. And uh, they look quite nice, quite interesting and quite varied, <clears throat> depending on the type of material, type of rock that you're using. These are colliding patterns and uh, can regenerate rules that reproduce similar patterns digitally. I, I started working on that in a totally unrelated way without knowing what is going to happen. I used um, <clears throat> a derivative of my work on modeling of expansion of cities 
and uh, this is all based on flock of birds model and based on bottom-up growth with local rules. And each one of these images is randomly generated and is therefore unique. And uh, I'm going to show you how this actually works because it might give you some idea as to what happened next with that. Okay, so that we just have two seeds here and these seeds create radial growth and then as is out of that, <coughs> you know, this sort of pattern emerges. Okay, we'll close this now because it might uh, look like watching paint dry. Um, but um, the next thing that I realized <coughs> was that um, with a slight adjustment of the rules in the previous model, I could produce images that potentially looked like animal pigmentation patterns. And uh, I can show that as well, actually. Okay, so this is, this is completed now. So here's something that could look like, like a cow pattern or Dalmatian pattern. And um, when I asked my little daughter, would you like that I print you out a cow pattern for your room? She said, yes, but can I have it in pink? So I, I didn't manage to do that at that time because I was very busy, but actually it can be done in pink, although Colors are different here because uh, the uh, projector changes the color, so it can be done in pink. Okay, <laughs> going back to the presentation. These patterns are actually called Voronoi patterns, and uh, they occur as a result of uh, collision, or not so much collision in this particular case, but uh, much more collision in the previous, uh, previous examples. And... Um, What's really interesting is, and to my amazement, is that uh, this is how termite nest looks when you slice it. Um, a group of mad scientists have filled a termite nest with plaster and then sliced it horizontally. And you can see here slices from near the bottom to near the top of the nest. And actually they look remarkably similar to the previous diagram of the uh, animal pigmentation patterns. So computer generated forms are similar to the next nest exteriors. Computer generated patterns as I showed earlier are similar to nest inter interiors. So can this enable us to build a computer equivalent of the nest and find out how it actually works and then apply it to buildings? But there's something missing, the rules of how the nest climate actually works. And uh, this is where we come to one of the uh, major problems that is still outstanding in today's uh, science and engineering. Uh, it's called uh, Navier's Tox equations. In order to, clo to close this loop, I had to revisit these methods that I studied during my first degree in mechanical engineering. And uh, these, de these equations describe the motion of fluids from the top down. So they have master, the equations have master controller. And this is how simple things are made very complicated. There are only two things here that the equations are modeling, Newton's second law and incompressibility of the fluid. And this is modeled top down. So these equations are based uh, are the basis of safety critical systems, numerous safety critical systems. If you fly by plane or live in a <coughs> flood threatened area, you should be worried about. Uh, there's no solution, no com complete solution for these equations. And this is uh, one of the uh, seven most important open problems in mathematics. And uh, there's a one million prize offered for one of the outstanding solutions. So I thought I'd better try. 
and um, um, supercomputers are used to produce incomplete results of the simulation of the uh, fluid in motion. So, going back to my flock of birds approach, I applied this to a packet, to packets of air. So there's no master controller, and uh, packets of air interact with other packets of air. It's the same kind of principle as uh, flock of birds model. And uh, I came up with this kind of uh, thing that I want to test. So I'm going to show you this as well. Okay, so this is the heat source, and we are now going to draw. Thank you. <laughs> we are now going to. Okay, that's the heat source. We are going to draw something that looks like a termite nest. And we are deliberately going to leave some gaps there so that things can leak out. And like this. And then we're going to start a simulation. So these packets of air go and interact with each other, just like a flock of birds model. And this is what happens. So if I, if I now want to add something there, this is fully interactive model. I must remind you that this normally runs on a very powerful supercomputer if you want to do Navier-Stokes equations properly. Uh, because that is top-down, but this now runs on my laptop because it's not top-down, and I think it does kind of reasonable job. So we can play with this model and uh, add things to it, uh, add obstacles there, and recreate what might look like a termite nest and uh, see what happens and learn, learn from that and try to apply it to, to buildings. Okay, so this is therefore an alternative approach to modeling and these models work on uh, um, parcel to parcel interaction and each parcel has uh, internal rules that uh, um, are very simple, still based on physics, still based on Newton's laws and, uh, and incompressibility of Freud, but there's no master controller. Okay, so this brings us close to the end, and uh, I'd just like to say that I hope that you now agree that uh, transfer knowledge from one discipline to another opens eyes and can help with solving seemingly impossible problems, and that the top-down approach in the traditional science has actually hindered our approach, uh, uh, hindered our understanding of nature and how numerous systems work. And that the bottom-up approach to problem solving blurs boundaries between disciplines and uh, that can help, it can help us in our journey of discovery. And therefore, interdisciplinary approach can go a long way towards solving seemingly impossible problems of, the today, of today's world. And the uh, journey of connecting the dots between discipline, disciplines continues. But there's still this problem, what is going to happen in year 2050? Will it be the end of the world as we know it? Because there'll be pressures from resource depletion, from population growth, and from climate change. All, all of this will be coinciding and culminating around 2050. And I believe that this will create opportunities for innovation and radical change, and that humanity will live up to the uh, challenge of embracing new opportunities and will create a better world. And what will this work do to help solve the year 2050 problem? The solution requires a response on the scale of the planet and uh, a considerable refocusing of resources and efforts. Advanced research is uh, the key to solving this problem and education. And a single research result, a single book, a single university course, a single conference will not make much difference. But <coughs> by making these lead by example, will be a replicator that will help to put the planet on a sustainable trajectory. And now it's time to say some thanks. 
I'd like first to say thanks to my parents, especially to my mother who have traveled very far. Um, my father couldn't be with us because he's passed away a long time ago. Um, to my wife and my three daughters, my brother with whom I collaborated uh, in research, my PhD supervisor, Dr. Leslie Esch, my BCU colleagues, Chris O'Neill, Derek Hustley, Kevin Singh, and numerous others, John Christophers and his family, uh, my colleagues from industry, publishers, uh, my students, PhD students, and you, the audience, and uh, also thanks to all those who challenged my ideas and thoughts, who uh, kept me intellectually alerted, inspired me, and most importantly, who helped me when they didn't need to. And uh, if you think that this is all work and not much play, Please think again, and thank you for listening. I'd like to thank Libba for his inspiring talk, and uh, I'm a victim of his inspiration, because the, um, I might, he convinced me to change all my LED bulbs in my house, so um, <laughs> I've not had it monitored yet, <laughs> so that's great. Um, right. I'd like to open up the floor and ask um, two or three questions from the audience, please. Who would like to go first? Lubo, thank you for your presentation. Um, you mentioned the termites, when it gets too hot or the temperature becomes too high, uh, going down into the soil, into the soil, becoming wet, and then returning to do the evaporative cooling. Your parcel, and I'm trying to equate a termite with a parcel, are your parcels identical in terms of the physical properties they have? Or can you, in your modeling, change those parcel properties to, to uh, replicate some of the variability that the termites may be putting into? Yes, uh, each parcel uh, is a self contained entity, and we can put uh, anything we want, any kind of functionality into it, and then that parcel. Uh, th there's a blueprint for the parcel which is then instantiated a number of times with uh, <coughs> different properties applied to, to that. So uh, there's a variety of the same parcel properties that can be applied in that way. I just use a blueprint and then spread out copies of that blueprint giving them different uh, properties. And uh, what I perhaps uh, should have said is that uh, um, the work on this is not done yet. Um, this is a little bit like uh, uh, a situation where we have uh, all components ready to actually go into one major piece of research again. It's a little bit like uh, um, making a cup of tea by uh, having the kettle ready and water and tea and uh, boiling the kettle but not doing yet much with it. So there's a next step that uh, needs to happen. Okay. Andy. In the research community, very often the, the way to succeed is to take one area of research and just move with that and become the expert in a small area. But I think your lecture demonstrates very well that actually interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary research gives you uh, much more interesting solutions and for that matter solutions that are much more relevant to your world. How can we change the research community towards that way of thinking, which seems to actually be more successful? That's a very good question. I'm not really sure. Uh, it is hard work because people are used to working in their own uh, areas. And uh, for example, when we were setting up the um, project on uh, emergent structures, I think some, some of the colleagues who worked on that project uh, or might be here, or maybe not, yes, uh, some, some of them. Uh, it took about six months to actually just convince them that they should abandon what they learned all of their lives uh, and try a different <laughs> approach. Uh, so I guess trying to replicate the knowledge by publishing and, uh, and evangelizing 
this is, is something that uh, needs to be done. No, um, we're, we're just trying, I'm just looking into applying the principles, not necessarily making everybody live in a <coughs> in a termite nest. But uh, <laughs> but uh, one thing that uh, that is becoming very interesting now is that uh, with three D printing, houses and buildings can be printed to take um, different forms. They don't need to be rectangular. They can be uh, more organic uh, forms and as a result of that we can actually <coughs> change the way how we are building buildings and uh, the methods that I'm trying to develop go part and parcel with these new methods of construction so there's still quite a lot of research to be done but uh, I'm, I'm kind of keen to apply principles rather than the form uh, and, uh, and that's I think where we need to go. Last question. Very well, I can see some similarity between the thermal modelling and the termite nest um, predictions. Uh, when looking at some of the retrofit situations in, in Victoria and Ed Edwardian buildings, the internal in interior weather situations can have some analogy with the stuff, stuff you're looking at. Have you been able to start linking what actually happens in um, 21st century occupation of Victoria dwellings and the past? <coughs> Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, my, my research student here has been looking into that. We, we use uh, weather data for 2030, 2050, and 2080, and we are looking into what uh, will um, be needed in order to keep zero carbon buildings zero carbon through climate change. And there are similar kinds of things that uh, we are looking into: uh, evaporative cooling and ventilation and shading and, and so on. So. Yes, that's being done. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank Lubo for demonstrating one of the key um, benefits of FAB, where we fuse both science and art together. And what I'd like to do is invite you for a multidisciplinary drink and a canapé yeah. on the second floor. So once again, can we thank Lubo for a great presentation? <laughs>